So you're 11, and you saw Swede Savage. You saw him break the track record at, in some trials in 73. Everybody realizes now 1973 was the worst, most tragic running of the Indy 500 in history. And at what point in life do you break the news to this child that your father was Swede Savage, this heroic figure, this incredibly good-looking, you know, race car driver who is really right on the cusp of greatness. It's Angela Savage, the posthumous child of Swede Savage, who was born to his widow, Cheryl, on October 5th, 1973. She was showered with unconditional love at the track, changed her life. Jeff Stearns, connected through cars. If they're bigwigs, we'll have them on the show. And yes, we'll talk about cars and everything else. Here he is now, Jeff Stearns. So if you don't mind, unless you have any more talk about with Miles Ahead, I would love to talk about the book. Are you willing to talk about it? I don't want you to, I don't, you know, maybe you'll... all right, you don't want to be a shameless self-promoter, but I mean, for God's sake, let's shamelessly self-promote because it's it's interesting, and I'm going to look at my notes. So you're 11, and you saw Swede Savage. You saw him break the track record at, in some trials in 73, and you were sitting in the turn four grandstand. That's not from memory. I did look at my notes. All right. So now, I mean, there's a lot of notes, but fast forward... You wrote a book about Swede. You know, so I grew up in suburban Chicago, and as a young boy, California just seemed like a paradise to me. And so when I learned about this driver, Swede Savage, you know, if you see a picture of Swede Savage, you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy, you know, he's extremely good looking. Women, you know, just were just like, wow, who's that guy? And to this day, and if you see the, well, the cover of our book, I just so happen to have a, so... That's Swede Savage, you know, extremely good looking guy. And uh, so anyway, you know, and he's from California, long, wavy, blonde hair. And, and furthermore, he was driving the number 40 STP oil treatment special. And when I was a kid, the first time I went to Indy was 67 when Parnelli Jones drove the SCP turbine car number 40. So I knew that this Swede Savage guy, when he drove the STP number 40 STP oil treatment special, I said, I don't know who this guy is, but he must be somebody special because only the best drivers get to drive that car, car number 40. And Andy Granatelli was Mr. STP and he was involved in everything else. And STP back then was like Red Bull is today. The brand was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Anyway, go to the Chine trials with my family and best friends sitting with me in the turn four grandstand. And this was the year that they were knocking on the door of the first 200 mile per hour lap. And Sweet Savage had the fastest practice lap leading up to pole day qualifying that year. Now they had had two weeks of practice. Opening day at the track was April 28th and the race day was May 30th. So, you know, there's like a whole month of practice and time trials leading up to this. So anyway, so a couple of the few other drivers qualified faster than Swede. Swede started on the inside of row four in his second Indy 500. The race, everybody realizes now 1973 was the worst, most tragic running of the Indy 500 in history. Unfortunately, Swede was a part of that. So the, the race had been delayed twice by rain. And they finally ran it on a Wednesday. And by this time, I'm in school. Uh, I'm in my sixth grade classroom. And I'm like, you know, they're, they're going to run the Indy 500 today. I have to follow this somehow. So I brought a transistor radio with me to school, put it in my desk. And I had one of those little earpieces, those earplugs that you put in your ear. And I turned my head away from the teacher so he wouldn't see my earplug. And I was listening to the Indy 500. And right behind me was a, a bulletin board that I had decorated with drawings of the cars in the race, including one of Sweet's car right behind me. Then he has this horrific accident on lap 59 coming out of turn four. Nobody knows to this day what caused it. I go into that in quite some detail in my book. And then when I hear that it was Sweet Savage in the crash, I'm, I'm just couldn't believe it. And I'm sitting in my sixth grade classroom trying to hide my emotions. Well, it took over an hour to clean up the track. And by then class was out and I had a little league baseball game later that day. And uh, then, of course, he survived the crash. He lived 33 days, died in the, the Indianapolis Methodist Hospital on July 2nd, 1973. But then within a year, I, a book was published about the 1973 running of the race. And I read this book cover to cover. By this time, I was 12 years old. And, it, and in this book, I learned that his wife, 
was pregnant at the time of the crash and was in the stands and saw the crash. And that immediately grabbed me. I'm like, how on earth can a pregnant woman? And, and, and now by this time, you know, Swede's dead. I'm reading this book and I'm like, what, how do you bring a child into the world under those circumstances? And, and at what point in life do you break the news to this child that your father was Swede Savage, this heroic figure, this incredibly good looking, you know, race car driver who was really right on the cusp of greatness. So th this story always fascinated me. Now, fast forward 40 years, and I met a guy on Facebook here in Indianapolis, Paul Powell, who was organizing a trip to the Indianapolis 500 for this woman named Angela Savage. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Is this the person I've been wondering about my whole life? And I introduced myself to Paul, and sure enough, it is. It's Angela Savage, the posthumous child of Swede Savage, who was born to his widow, Cheryl, on October 5th, 1973. And that just started really kind of a miraculous relationship uh, that I maintain to this day. And now Angela works for me, her husband works for me at Miles Ahead. I mean, so that's kind of the the... The, the quick elevator story, if it's even that quick, but, uh, and you were producer in her podcast, right? Right. So she had a podcast for a couple of years, good news with Angela Savage, where she would have on figures from the racing world. And I mean, these were, you know, Ari Leondyke, two time Indy 500 winner, Wally Dallenbach, who took over her father's ride after her father died in 1973, uh, and then became the, the chief steward for cart for years and years. And then her last show was Mario Andretti that we shot at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway overlooking the main straightaway. And with that, she's like, okay, can't top that. We've done 40 shows. You know, that that's a wrap. So, uh, so yeah, I helped her produce that show. And uh, she had never been to a race of any kind until the Indy 500 in 2014. So it was kind of like the prodigal daughter coming to Indy. And when she came to Indy, of course, the story got out. There was The story was written up in USA Today. And, uh, you know, people just couldn't believe it. There's like, oh my, when you hear that story and here comes the girl who was born three months after his death to Indy for the first time, it just captivated people, still captivates me today. So she was showered with unconditional love at the track, changed her life. And she had had an extremely difficult life, which I go into in quite a bit of detail in the book. So the book is not really, Savage Angel is not a typical racing book. I can say that for sure. It's about as close to a biography as Swede Savage as there's ever going to be. But it also digs into what's really the elephant in the room in the racing world. What happens to the family after a tragedy like this? What are the effects when this family is, is, is in the wake of this tragedy? And Angelo's life is uh, quite a interesting example of that. That's a very interesting point of view. And I'm really proud of you that you decided to attack it. And when you talk about, when you describe what it must have been like to be the pregnant mother in the stands watching this. And then when you describe what it must have been like to have to disclose this to her daughter one day, you're not just saying it, you're like being it. I can feel it with you. So I can tell that you got a lot of emotional investment in the thing and that you're a good guy. You're a very empathic. You have a lot of empathy for these people. And, you know, I'm guilty of watching a sport and there's a wreck or a fighter getting knocked out or a concussion. You know, I'm guilty of not thinking about other than just the event right there. I mean, I'll, I'll admit that. So you've got me thinking now off this way. Very interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, looking up, looking at the book and I need another book. So this will be wonderful. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear about Angela, the daughter coming to Indianapolis and you're saying that it changed her life. Can you, exp I mean, can you explain what that means a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So she had, uh, it, and this is something, it's something we're going to find out very soon here with the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks coming up in a few weeks. There's a documentary coming out on that takes a, a look at, a, I think, about four of these children uh, that were born to mothers whose husbands died in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. From my research and doing the book, there were 108 babies born to mothers whose uh, husbands died in the terrorist attacks. So the, these are called posthumous children. 
So, the, and this is, of course, Angela preceded that by almost 30 years. You know, when you're, so, so imagine the father dies in this narrow nine month window bec- between conception and birth. So this documentary is coming out. I just saw the, the trailer on it yesterday. It causes problems in these children's lives as they grow up. There's a lot of uh, anxiety, um, depression, confusion, uh, self-identity issues, and Angela experienced all that. The problem is Angela experienced all this before people were even aware of it. Um, she had a lot of mental health issues that weren't easily articulated or understood at the time. They are now. And the book goes into great detail as to the medical explanation as to why Angela's life turned out the way it did. That being said, when to get back to your question, how did it change her life? She didn't realize that people still remembered her father. This has been Jeff Stearns, Connected Through Cars.